name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Your Excellency, Reverend Fathers, dear seminarians, brothers, sisters, and my dear faithful, already centuries before our Lord Jesus Christ, Solomon would write those words that have, through the ages, condemned the futility of human achievements. Vanity of vanities, and all is vanity. And we think of how many generations have passed before us and left nothing, the one after the other. And if we think of works and our labors simply as they are human, simply as they are material, then indeed they are vanity of vanities. But the words of the epistle of today to the Galatians elucidate those words of Solomon to a large degree. The words of Solomon, vanity of vanities, are not a condemnation of sowing, of labor, but of sowing in the flesh, of sowing so as to reap a transient reward. We would think how unsatisfying would be the labor of working for wages, of working for um, wages in a country that would coin its, uh, its bills, who would uh, mint its coins, we could say, in ice, in ice cubes. And so when you're paid, you grab your ice cube and try to run down to the store before it melts. The idea of something so transient would be, well, what am I working for? And yet, when we see over the aspect of the centuries that the money, the honors, the glory that people have worked for, has it been much better, in fact, than those ice cubes? It has all passed away. Even those things that are one, and to make of our life something, well, how much of life is not? Despite all our best labors, we could say, well, still lost in sleep. One doesn't enjoy their possessions while asleep. How much is lost in illness, in anxiety, in sadness? And of all these things, we might say, of which we, ways in which one might so in the flesh, I would like to say a few words, especially on that of vain glory, which is really sowing again in order to reap the goods of the flesh, the goods that disappear so quickly. And what is vain glory, but simply the desire to manifest one's own excellence unduly. And it is so dangerous because it seems through this manifestation of our excellence, through this glory that we seem to, to have, that all other goods, all other acknowledgments, all other honors, all other merits, if you like, and, and entitlements will come to us. And so this idea of being glorified in the eyes of my neighbor has a special attraction. And St. Thomas breaks that down for us in the ways it's possible. It might be in simply something external, which um, is especially futile. I take glory in my clothes. I take glory in my car. I take glory in my looks. These things that I think St. Francis de Sales says, well, if anyone takes glory in your clothes, it should be the one that sewed them, the one that designed them not simply the one that wears them. Um, and yet that's the, the attraction that somehow this will, will resound to, to my praise. So we should examine ourselves to see if we are of that spirit, to associate some greater quality in myself simply because of what I possess, regardless of how transient it is, and I glorify myself because of that. And St. Thomas also says then of where we hope to find that glory. And the, again, this reaches the point when we look at it unbiasedly of absolute absurdity, as when the politicians 
seek the approval of mobs that you might say are least capable often of judging the the case in hand or as when perhaps i go downtown and i'm worried about what a stranger thinks it's, well what possible concern do you have of that stranger's judgments when you have no idea in which his judgment is formed it's like well does um, he uh, think I, what does he think of my car? What does he think of my appearance? What does he think of my making the sign of the cross? What does he uh, think of the, uh, the way I speak or things like that? Um, perhaps he's a foreigner and his judgment of your English should be the last of your concerns. And yet the sense of we, one can be, fearful, one can be vainglorious for the opinions of those that matter not at all. And then what if their opinion should matter to the degree that they are upright and reasonable? Well, St. Thomas says then, and this is the uh, subtlest of the dangers of vainglory, because he says one might take honor or glory in something that is itself deserving, such as virtue. And yet he associates that um, to himself rather than to God. He, uh, he credits the good to himself rather than to God. And he uses the valuable thing not for his eternal end or for the salvation of his neighbor, but to his own um, temporary advantage. And again, sowing in the flesh. And of the flesh, as St. Paul tells us, we will only reap corruption. And perhaps a, a way to express this particular, this specific danger of vainglory is to somehow as well contrast it to pride with which it often seems to overlap. And we can see that in some of the effects. The proud person, for example, will have a sense of his own deserts, of what he's entitled to, and through the sense of his own deserts will often be ambitious. And, well, I'm going to get that, and I deserve this. And the evil of pride will lead him to those evils of pursuing uh, an end, even a noble end, unworthily. The vainglorious person, on the contrary, although vainglory will usually lead to pride when it's unchecked, uh, he is desirous of glory, but he's often content with what he has or what with what he imagines he has. And so uh, he is content to dwell on that. And in fact, rather than leading him to this dangerous ambition, it is in fact very paralyzing. He is enervated because, well, I already have that glory. If I consider it in this aspect or if I consider it in that aspect, it's already mine, if you like. And you see there indeed the, um, the, the paralyzing aspect of idle daydreaming, which is just to, if it's not there, then I can imagine it's there. The reason I am honorable, the reason I am excellent, the, the, the acknowledgement that I might receive in other circumstances. And the danger as well, um, we are often happy that our children are reading rather than watching um, television or the, the filth that is so available from the world. But beware that even reading then, if it's not constructive, and if it's merely there to, to indulge this idle imagination, this wild imagination, this constant um, escape into Never Never Land, 
uh, that's not wholesome. It is this paralyzing element of vainglory. And through and with that paralyzing vice, again, the, one of the great dangers of vainglory is that it can paralyze and corrupt all other goods that one does. And so as one goes out to sow and to sow their seed in good ground, vainglory, by crediting myself with that labor, by seeking a transient end to that la labor, seeking those wages of ice cubes that will immediately evaporate, it des can destroy even the best of works. What a terrible vice. Vanity of vanities. And yet, as I said, these words of St. Paul elucidate the words of King Solomon, because he does not only say, he who sows in the flesh shall reap corruption, he says, he that sows in the spirit will reap eternal life. The fact that if we look at human achievements as material, as human, they pass away into nothingness. But if we look at them in the aspect or from the aspect of the divine as human moral actions, actions which are performed by a more, an immortal soul, we can say each and every one of these actions is etched in stone and something harder than the stone. Because if time is passing, God is outside of time and everything for him is an eternal now. And I might easily say, well, that evil deed of 10 years ago, now it's past and gone. It's now to God. And that good deed, which you have perhaps forgotten, it seems so little five years ago, who remembers that? Who even saw it? It's now to God. God sees it and remembers it. And that is the sowing in the Spirit. And if I did that for God, not for the people that might have seen it and forgotten it, but I did it for God, he remembers it even now, even when you forget, even when you, the person who would most like to remember it, cannot, God does. And so too, the, if the, the rewards have often disappeared, the habits from those actions often remain. And that's why each one can be so important because it is forming um, those powers by which I will do the future ones. And again, each one of such crucial importance because it is in that eternal now of God who sees those things and who will reward them um, as they deserve. And in fact, if they are done in God, if they are sown in the Spirit, it would be actually unfair to say he will reward them simply as they deserve if they are done in the Spirit, if they are done in Christ, if they are done in this confidence of our Redeemer, he will reward them as Jesus Christ deserves and as we are united in our Lord Jesus Christ. He who sows in the Spirit of the Spirit will reap eternal life. It is something which indeed even our daydreaming cannot imagine what is eternity what does it mean to be happy for eternity to possess a kingdom which eye has not seen nor ear heard about and to possess that king kingdom for eternity let us turn to the blessed virgin who kept all these things in her heart when she sowed she only sowed in the spirit in the Spirit, in her divine spouse, the Holy Ghost, and who, right now, as we speak, um, possesses that kingdom and will possess it for eternity and calls us to possess it with her. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.